G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Today we have a special treat, an insight into why I'm drawn to risk, challenges and growing small businesses. I interview my father and learn a lot more about his business journey. This one is a ripper and just made my favourite cast yet. Aged 20 in 1966, Dad got his first job off the farm in a petrol station, bought a truck, grew the fuel distribution company, added a business partner, which didn't end well a few years later. With some time out of the distribution game, he was approached to rebuild another distributor nearby. Grew from one FTE himself to 30, zero sales to 80 million, and selling over 100 million litres a year, eight years after starting in 1989. Credits the team to the phenomenal success, thinks he got 90% of the hires right and believes in looking after your people. Dad and his new business partner started with little capital, had six months to prove they could build the volume sales before BP gave them a long-term contract, funded the fast growth in a risky but genius way, putting more than $3 million on the overnight money market for 15 months right after the 1990 recession and earned 21% or $600,000 in interest per year. With some luck and brotherly advice, Dodge losing $6 million the business had in their bank when that bank went under a week after withdrawing all funds. I didn't realise Dad loved the business challenge as much as me. Felt they had succeeded when they got through the first six months. Hardest thing about growing a small business is choosing the right people. And advice Dad would give himself on day one is seek more advice about running a business and in particular talk to other people who own a business, especially those older and with more experience. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing my father, John Truen, uh, from Advanced Petroleum many years ago. Thanks for your time today, Dad. You're welcome, Troy. It's a pleasure to be on the show. You've been listening to most of the casts, I think, and you're our top reviewer, I believe. <laughs> I have been listening to them most weeks, yes. Now, something been bugging me for ages. Your first name is actually Richard, but you go by your middle name, John, which seems to be a common thing of your generation. I've been meaning to ask, why is that? Well, it goes a long way back because my father was christened Richard Lloyd. Yeah. He was known as Lloyd. My mother was Lucy Jean. She was called Jean. And uh, for, uh, so it just flowed through. So I'm Richard John and I got called John. Yeah, right. But I've noticed... But nobody was ever able to explain why. Yeah, because there's a lot of people of your generation that seem to do that. So it's something I've been meaning to ask for a while. So the first question is pretty easy. How do we know each other? I think it was 46 years ago, nine months and three days that I was born. Yeah. So it's been, been almost half a century. You're not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> you still yeah. got four years to go. <laughs> yeah, oh, three. You're a young fella. Three, three years. I'm not feeling it that young these days. But uh, So tell our audience a bit about your business. I th- well, the last big one, I guess, was Advanced Petroleum. But uh, So maybe we'll talk about that today and obviously your journey um, through to that stage. Okay. So I started in the oil industry way back in 1966. Mm-hmm. So you would have been, let me work this out, you were... 20. 20, yeah. 20 years old. And um, previous to that, I worked for four years on the farm for my father. Yep. And uh, there was a bad drought in 66. So uh, he said, it's time for you to go and find a job somewhere else. So the first place I came to was a Caltech service station. Well, literally, you were driving into town and you just stopped at the servo. Yeah, that was the first business or place of employment I could see. So I I wheeled in there and asked the guy, do you have any work? He said, yes, you can start tomorrow. And so that that started my 38-year journey in the oil industry. Wow, yeah. So to, you know, to cut a long story short, I guess a couple of years after that, Nine, three years after that, late 68, 69, uh, I got the opportunity to um, buy a truck, borrow some money off my dad, and um, for 12 months loan, he said, put the money back in 12 months. Yeah, great. So away I went in the truck and delivering fuel to farmers in the local area, and uh, it grew from there, and in 19... 79 formed a partnership. Bill Luck? Agent in the area. Was that Bill Luck? 
Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, that lasted for four or five years and sort of didn't, didn't uh, work out well. Uh, and there was no contracts between us. So, uh, you know. Oh, that old chestnut. <laughs> it's very, old chestnut, yeah. very common, isn't it? Yeah. Learn, learn next time around. So, yep. uh, anyway, still in the oil industry. And in 1989, I was approached by a friend in the oil industry from a, a different company, BP. And um, he said, uh, we have an inland storage terminal at Shepparton, not too far away. So at that time you were at that time you were living in Wangaratta, you and Faye. Living in Wangaratta, that's right. Yep. yep. Which is northeast Victoria for those not aware, just two hundred kilometers, a bit over two hundred kilometers northeast of Melbourne. Yep. Correct. In the country. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, drew, you moved to Shepparton, which is directly north pretty much of Melbourne. Correct. Yeah. Similar similar distance, 180, 200 kilometers. Yep. Anyway, this inland terminal was on the rail line. That's what it was called an inland terminal. And the, the licensee that was running it walked out or sold all his customers to an opposing oil company and um, I was offered the opportunity to uh, with with a with a um, uh, the son of the friend in Wangaratta who introduced me into the BP um, sales manager was that was that Chris the friend Chris, yeah yeah Chris and and Tom here. Tom was and, your sales uh, manager Went and had a look at it, and it was quite uh, remarkable. All the gates were locked, of course, and and uh, there was no staff. Every everything was gone. The tanks were empty. So Chris and I said, "All right, let's have a go. We'll start from zero. And uh, we did. One truck, one employee. You, just you. Hit the road, yeah. Hit <laughs> the road, uh, selling. So." Um, that was the start of Advanced Petroleum in late 1989. See, that my memory, I didn't realise that because my memory was you kind of took over an existing business. But, yeah, that's phenomenal. If you... It was actually a closed business. There yeah, was right. not one dollar going through the till. Yep, right. So, um, and the BP said, we will give you six months to make a go of it. And if if you, you know reach a volume point which the oil industry back then was all about volume sell 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 volume volume so we did and we signed a contract with bp later in just at the end of 1989 and uh the contract was chris and myself at 50 percent and bp the other 50 percent because we needed some capital yep we neither of us had a lot of capital so um, away we went, and um, it was the start of the recession in 1990. Great time to start a business. It's everybody said, you are crazy, John. <laughs> anyway, we had nothing to lose because it didn't cost any money to go in there. So we bought an old truck, put on a driver, and um, Chris did the admin, and I did the selling. And um, in... About uh, six months, we didn't have much cash. So we went to BP and said, look, we need to pay a little bit late. They said, oh, yeah, you're going to have 90 days. So we said, oh, good. So what, <laughs> we did, what we did is we went and sold petroleum products anywhere we could get cash for it. So with that cash... We invested it on the on the overnight money market at interest rates of up to twenty one percent per annum. Really? So this this is in nineteen ninety, and it ran through till interest rates started to come down about uh, towards the end of nineteen ninety. So we had a good 12, 15 months of, of high interest rates. And what kind of ca- capital were you putting on the overnight money market? Um, in by the end of the sixth month upwards of um, uh, $3 million. And you're making 21% a, a year on that. Yeah. So 600 grand, that's very smart financing. So but the, the, we did that. It was just one night we were wondering how we're going to com- compete with, our, with our, our, our opposition. And um, 
we needed to grow pretty quickly. So by selling a little bit cheaper, we were able to and, and offer a good price for cash to farmers, to any, we'd sell anybody hmm. and, uh, and get the cash in and having 90 days to pay it, we'd bang it straight into the bank on the overnight money market. Wow. So that funded the, the, the operation because we weren't making anything out of the, the, the fuel. fuel we were selling that at cost. Because I remember you, you came back from a, a fuel conference in the US, I think, and, and you said all the money is in convenience stores. That's Correct. where, like in the US, they're the leaders, obviously. Yeah. And you came back with that idea and, and, and that's, oh, you're probably going to talk about it in a minute, but I, I distinctly remember that lesson learned. Yeah. That there was really no money in actual selling of fuel. No. Well, that was the next transition, actually. As we grew the volume, we were... Uh, took on another small storage facility at Cobram, about 80 kilometres away, uh, and um, gradually spread further out. But what was restricting us was the um, movement of the product from the seaboard terminal, Melbourne, to the inland depots or inland terminals. It all had to go by rail to Shepparton, and rail to um, Wodonga. And it's quite expensive, isn't it, rail rather than well, rail? Yeah, rail. and it was a government legislation up until I think the mid-90s and then it all changed and we were able to um, actually take our own trucks to the seaboard terminal and bring it out a lot cheaper. Mm. So, but we weren't the only ones doing that, of course, so we, we didn't have any advantage on our competition in that in that sense except for... We sought some modern methods of truck, uh, you know, like truck configurations, so we could cut maximum amount of um, liters in the in the truck to cut and that cut the cost down. So we we were one of the first to have what they call a mini B double. Uh, actually, we were the they first in Victoria, and the first one was in New South Wales at Wagga, and. Um, that brought some efficiencies and where we were able to short haul Melbourne to Shepparton and Melbourne to Cobram, we were, were able to triple shift the truck. So the truck went seven days a week, 24 hours a day, having three drivers. Good use of very expensive up. equipment. Yeah, each, each truck, I guess, was at that time around half a million dollars. And wow. Probably 1.2 or $3 million these days. Yep. But... The technology in those trucks hasn't changed enormously since since that time, but they've got a little bit more fuel efficient. But the volumes that they can cut aren't any more because it's all it's all about weight on the road, how much weight you can put on a, on an axle. Yep. So that was another side to our business where we we could become more efficient and become not only fuel sellers, but transport operators mm -hmm. so it was about making money out of, out of the trucks as well as trying to make some money out of the fuel which was very difficult because it was so competitive yeah so we saw some opportunities in service stations leasing service stations and operating them which we did at um we bought one at shepparton um leased one at wagga wangaratta vanilla there was about five, I suppose. I worked in the one in Benalla, didn't I? Correct, when I yeah. <laughs> just yeah. before I went to uni and when I was at uni, yeah. yeah. And the bigger ones, there was an op it was about, there was a, uh, a um, real push to try and make money out of fuel. So we found that by selling the fuel at a, bit lower price and getting someone in and pay at the counter, there was an opportunity there to have um, convenience items for sale, chocolates, yep. ice creams, cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Cigarettes used to be up to 30% of all our convenience store sales. Wow. It was mm -hmm. big. But it got people in to the shop where you could sell them anything from, you know, chips to and you know, like the space to sell the petroleum products for oil and that would make up a very small part of the shop. The rest would all be junk food and uh, impulse items. Yep. 
So that, that's when we started making some, some good money then. So the trucks were making money. The convenience stores were making money. So um, it, it grew from there. And in 1997, our turnover had gone from zero in 1st of July, 89, to $80 million in, by the end of 19, 1997. Wow. So that's, that's revenue. That's eight years. That's amazing. Yeah. And we, from one, one full-time employee to uh, upwards of 30, I suppose, 28 to yep. 30. Had you stopped gambling on the overnight money market by then? I think that because <laughs> by, um, by 92, the interest rates were back to 6.5%. So it wasn't worth it. <clears throat> well, there was another reason why we couldn't do much because <laughs> the oil companies, or BP in particular, we didn't only buy off BP, even though they were a partner. We said, well, look, if you can't match prices, you can't sell to us cheaper than I can buy somewhere else, we'll buy it somewhere else. And they said, well, okay, we've got to live with that. So they were always fairly competitive. Mm. But our payment terms shrank. By the end of, um, they, they woke up to what we were doing. But in saying that, they were also happy that we were increasing the volume, which they wanted us to do. By the end of, um, Probably 91, we were back to 60 days. Yeah. And the 92, back to 30 days. Right. Yep. <laughs> I just made it 30 days right through. So it was getting harder and harder to sell fuel for cash for less because the interest rates had dropped right, right off and we had to pay quicker. Yep. Hmm. So yeah, from memory, so you peaked around 80 million. And from memory, you were selling about 100 million litres a year. Is that right? Was that your peak? Um, Bit more than that at that time, yes, because fuel, the retail price of petrol, for example, unleaded petrol at that time was about seventy-five cents a litre. Yep, it's about double now. Yeah. 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 Right. And uh, and then so after ninety-seven, what, what the next few years after that? Well, we, we concentrated on um, expanding our territory. We went to Wagga. Um, got a toehold there and Albury Wodonga. Uh, and that proved profitable from the transport side of things because there was money and if you could efficiently cut fuel, you could make good money out of trucks. Right, great. And you obviously retired. Do you want to maybe finish the journey, the timeline on that? What? what uh... Well, in... in 2000, 90, end of 99, 2000, uh, the, all, all the oil companies were starting to buy back their um, distributors, licensees. As the licenses came up for renewal, I was saying, look, we will renew on these terms um, or we'll buy you out. Yep. Here's, here's an offer. And the terms would be not very generous, I'm assuming. Well, it, they were. Um, in some instances, where where a um, licensee or distributor had a really firm toehold and, and owned, say, his retail outlets, his service stations, he was in a position where he could, let, if, if he could lease them back to the oil company, mm-hmm. which added a bit of a sweetener to the to the offer of the buyout, but. On average, I think it was about um, five times multiples. Yep. Yeah. Yep. On average. And at that time, you Advance was one of four distributors for BP in Victoria, wasn't it? Um, no, at that time, because see, there was we had, you've got places like Gippsland, Wimra. There's probably eight, I'd say. Right, and they were, but they were consolidating them down. They were consolidating. Well, when, when in 1989, there was probably BP would have had 40 yep. small towns, you know, uh, towns with only two or 3,000 people might have a storage facility and it was expensive to operate and keep. Because every time you mo- moved petroleum products, you lose some in yes. evaporation and shrinkage from the temperature. So it's the least times you can move it. That was what our big incentive to pick up seaboard terminal and take it straight to the customer. Very clever, yeah. 
What kind of shrinkage do you get or loss, if you, if you remember? Well, we had two types of shrinkage. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the one of The biggest them. one, yeah. the biggest one was uh, in, in the convenience stores mm-hmm. where in the industry average was 3%. Yep. And we got it down to 1.5%, which was a pretty good effort. Took a, you know, cameras and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so it was, it was staff skimming stock. Mainly staff. Yeah, most of it was start. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's it's such big. I remember measuring those tank underground tanks in Wangaratta at the, the Caltech service station you had there before you took over BP. I mm-hmm. remember putting the giant dipsticks in there, and they're massive holdings. Obviously, you, you can't get very accurate readings with those, so it would be quite easy for people to be taking. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't the petroleum products that go missing. It was the shop items. Oh right, yeah, because mm-hmm. all, all the product was metered through to, to the end user so you yep. always knew and you could always balance but the, sh- the shrinkage in petroleum products was from evaporation and, and yep. the time you handled it right it, it was uh when it was it used to be temperature corrected when we bought it from the seaboard terminal so we might lose i don't know 0.02 percent or something right a big volume so got it it, it added up yep and so what year was it you you uh, threw the keys to the BP? Was it 2004? Well, in 2001, we reached agreement uh, and they bought our 50%. Um, yeah, so I can't remember the month in 2001, but it was a satisfactory arrangement. Yep. Uh, the, the, uh, one way or another, the oil companies... We're going to do it to everybody anyway. So, and, and, and they said that was a reasonably um, a fair offer that everybody got, you know. Yep. Because they knew that we're all making money. And did, years before we weren't. And did they, and did they ask you to stick around for a year or two to run it, or they basically said we'll take it from here? It's just no, because we'd already had BP in there as a, a partner. Um. They had a, 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 their own um, rep who used to call, so he was pretty au okay with the business. And we were open, we were very transparent about the whole thing. Which we had to be in there because I own 50% of it. Yeah, that's right. I guess <laughs> it works. Yeah. Right. So there, there's some key numbers for growth. It illustrates zero to 80 million, over 100 million litres a year, zero, one to 30 FTE. That's phenomenal, Dad. Mm-hmm. When was... When was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? Um, I guess when we got through that first six months. That, I know that's pretty early, but I thought that when we went in there, I thought this is going to be a battle. And after every week that went past, I found out something new in that there's a way here where we can do things a little bit more efficiently. Yep. So... And because interest rates were, or to borrow, upwards of 17%, we couldn't afford to borrow money. And that was the instant, that's when we struck on the idea, why don't we sell as much as we can for cash? Yep. Get cash, make no profit out of the fuel, but then we'll just bang it in the bank and see if we can get better terms out of our supplier, which we did. That's great. That's really wily. Mm. Mm. And what does success look like to you? Uh, I guess it's the um, satisfaction of, uh, of being able to um, pick a good team because that, that business would be couldn't have got where it was without the right people. And I guess in ninety percent of the cases, I think I picked, or well, Chris and I picked the right people. And, uh, and you know, t- they knew what they had to do. Um, we didn't, we didn't uh, let them go, you know, they went and did their job. Yeah, you get A players on the bus and I remember that Steve Jobs quote, you don't hire good people to tell them what to do, you hire them so they can tell you, you know, what needs to happen in, the, in their corner of the business. Exactly. You know, and they were, they were, some of the, the IT people and the accountant and uh, top mid man, man they, they were far smarter than me in their areas so, and, they, and that's how it worked. Yeah, I remember you saying, well, I think I was a teenager, that, that old adage of always hire people smarter than yourself. 
Um, Mm -hmm. And until probably five years ago, I actually thought you made that saying up. But anyway, thought (laughs) giving you the the credit. (laughs) (laughs) I I remember distinctly you raving particularly about your accountant you had there for years. What was his name? We had uh, Ray Adams Mm. and then Craig Marshall. Craig, that's it. And and Craig, he was a brilliant young guy. He was a young guy, yeah, that's right. Really, really good. Yeah. Because at the time we sort of kicked off that, the oil industry didn't have a very good, um, if you like, an industry computer system. Yep. Uh, because uh, I mean, it's fairly complex and you've got your storage and then you've got to be able to meter the stuff. And um, So he was in the forefront of developing his computer software with BP and then eventually went around all the other BP licensees. I remember distinctly in Benalla, where the town I grew up in, when you were the Keltex, you had the Keltex business there with Bill Luck, that big old brown brick building on the, coming into town from Shepparton <laughs> you guys had there for years and years. And I remember you put in this giant computer and the massive printers, the A3 printers with the holes in the side that went through the dot matrix thing. And that I think that's where my fascination started with computers. Obviously, that was one of the degrees I did at uni. And uh, so I think I've got you to um, blame for... Uh, my love-hate relationship with technology these days, but that was a massive, really? massive computer, and you guys were one of the first ones to invest in computerizing, weren't you? Back, it was extremely expensive. Yeah, like, uh, it literally took up, it literally took up one of the rooms, didn't it? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. I can still yeah. remember walking in there. Yeah. yeah, I would have been ten at the time. I reckon ten or eleven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it needed about five or six people there to, to um, do all the inputting. Wow, that's amazing. No, there, was bar- there was no barcoding in those days. No, it was all, it was a punch card? Yep. Wow, that's that old punch card. Then, yeah, old, no, that, and the one that you're talking about, no, it wasn't punch card. The pre- previous old one was punch card. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> Great. Let's talk about marketing. What's the number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business? Um, again, pick the right people. Mm hmm and um, give them something to work with. So this is marketing? Yep. 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 So because obviously very customer-facing f- business, so having the right people that are happy and, you know, bubbly people makes a good impression yes. on, on the customers. Because yeah. a lot of our business, uh, we had quite a 50% or so retail, yep. which was through a service station. Um, the other 50% was, or 40% would have been direct to the agricultural businesses. Yep. The other 10% to the transport industry. And the agricultural side of it was quite profitable, but had to be very careful because it was also could be cap, quite capital intensive if you were lending the agricultural uh, businesses storage facilities and that sort of stuff on their big farms. Yep. So it was a bit of a balance, but once we got a, a customer, we worked very hard to keep the customer. Yep. And we didn't, you know, like getting them to pay was the hardest thing. So we, we introduced incentives for that too. Yep. But it was much cheaper to keep a customer and have a lot of churn. Definitely. They're very expensive to go and chase new business. Yeah. So we, we spend, with the marketing, not after the first four or five years, uh, not chasing as much business but making sure we weren't going to lose any of the business because most of the businesses were growing. Yeah, right. So right. Their, their, their usage was increasing. Yep. Well, here's one of those curly questions I texted you to say that I was going to ask a few off-piece here. It's marketing. Can you talk about the genius marketing you and Tom, your sales manager, did to come up with the name Advanced Petroleum? Well, it wasn't us. Oh, wasn't it? I thought. <laughs> no. I was sitting with my friends, my friend in Wangaratta, who's it was his son Chris who came into the business, and sitting there, and we opened the yellow pages. And that's where we started. Got the A, Advance. Top, top place everywhere you see, pick up the phone book, A's there, 
yeah. you're looking for a, a trade or a business, you, A pops out first. So we said advance. <laughs> it was really, it was basically his idea, not mine. But we just sat there um, and with the yellow pages, not deliberately with the yellow pages, but it was there. Yeah. Yeah. It just goes to show how marketing and or advertising, sorry, has changed. Obviously, yellow pages were huge back then, and people would literally open the book, start from A's, and look through for mm. a service provider. So, and interestingly enough, I'm based in Tasmania. Obviously, as you know, you're in M- Melbourne, but uh, the, they BP actually kept the Advanced Petroleum name because it's still floating around here, down even in Tasmania. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, most, it's mainly through Victoria and Tassie. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, let's talk about funding. Apart from the overnight money market, you, you, so you didn't have much or any real startup capital, did you? Uh, yeah, well, Chris and I, we put in some money each. Yeah. Uh, I'd sell some real estate and put the cash in. Mm-hmm. And um, from there, we just had to generate cash or we're out, we're out of business. Yeah. Yep. We had our wages to pay, one driver's wage and then and, and, and on and on it goes because the more, the more you sell, the more it costs to um, operate. Yep. And any other funding, assume no government grants, bank overdraft or loans or anything like that? No, we, there was no such thing as a government grant in those days. Yep. And the banks... I'm not going to start. I'm not going to let you start talking about the government either, Dad, because we'll be. Here no, for hours. I'm not going to get into that foray. Uh, <laughs> yep. Banks wouldn't lend to us anyway because we had no security. Yeah. Okay. So that was another driver, and we were just fortunate that at that time the recession was there with those high interest rates. That's and amazing. That's it's amazing. An opportunity. Yeah, that's amazing that the recession was actually an opportunity for you from yeah. a funding point of view. Wow. So it funded our business for the first 18 months. I guess a lot of business owners wouldn't have thought about that. I know there's obviously risk involved throwing it. I mean, how big was the risk chucking on the overnight money market? Oh, it was, we, we made sure it was with the banks, but although we did for a couple of months when Pyramid, remember Pyramid was a, a bank, yep. was a bank, a, a, an independent bank. Mm-hmm. Well, we had about $6 million in there at one stage. and uh, They went under, didn't they? I got a bit nervous, got a call from my brother. He was in Colac. He said, better be careful. So anyway, we pulled our money and they didn't want to give it to us. Mm. We just got it out in time because a week later they were gone. Wow. So you would have lost the whole six million and everything's evaporated. The business is gone. Lost BPs because most of that money was for um, the supplies we're buying. Yep. So yeah, it would have destroyed the business. Jeez. But we only did it once. Yep. And then we we did it um, sort of straight up. Or we went back to doing it straight up, yep. secured through the Commonwealth Bank at the time it was. Yep. Great. Well, I think I know the answer to this one. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into that industry? Uh, yeah, knowing what I know now. Yeah. You yes. would. You'd go back to fuel, even though it's effectively a declining sector with electric coming on? Well, yeah, but there's opportunities there, and the opportunities are in retail. Yep. Um. And the number of service stations has gone from like 20,000 down to 3,000 or whatever in the state. And there's new suburbs built mm-hmm. every year, like the develop, development around Melbourne, and it's going to continue a little slow for a while. Yep. But the opportunities are there. And when we were retailing the petrol, our gross margin was, say, four cents a litre. Mm-hmm. These days, the gross margin is between 18 and 26 cents a litre. Wow. And that inflation doesn't make that difference in, uh, in 10 years, you know. Wow. So there's some big opportunities there. Yeah, I was just reading about John Ibrahim the other day. Have you heard of him in Sydney? Yeah. Massive service station owner in Sydney and he's late, his latest distillery down here in Tasmania, I was just reading the other day, he's spending $14 million on the build and then $7 million a year in OPEX to mm-hmm. lay down whiskey for three years. So that is a $35 million play right there. Wow. And I think that's his fourth distillery he owns in Tasmania. Old Kempton, he helped start that one up. Sheen, mm-hmm. 
Mackey, which is a massive one, 400,000 litres a year. And there's another big one out at Glen Orkey here in Hobart that's gone up. So he's probably, I'm guessing here, looking at investing, probably not all his own money. I'm sure he's got investors in, but somewhere from 30 to $80 million in whiskey down here in Tasmania. Wow. Um, so I th- yeah, I suspect there is still money in service stations, Dad. You might be right. Yeah, you, you know, if, if you if you know what you're doing, uh, and yeah. you've had experience in the industry, there's, there's definitely if you've got, a, you've got some capital, there's some money to be made. Yep. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Well, yeah, I guess um, there's never a need. Never a, this is not not my words, but it's a quote from someone. There's never a need to get worked up about things you can't control. Yep. It took a long time to get that through my head. And uh, once uh, I started to realise that, well, it, it, it was much less stressful. But, yeah, the early days were very stressful. Well, just on that, I think that's uh, your kind of stoic attitude to life. Uh, you know, Adam, Danny, my two brothers and I, I think, you know, really have taken a leaf out of your book. So you've obviously haven't been um, armed with that kind of insight or um, mindset for all of your life. So you've, you've obviously learnt a few hard lessons over the, over the time and worried about things you didn't need to. Correct, yeah. So back to the most stressful point. Can you think of one? Probably when the partnership broke up in the first business back in 19, the mid-80s. With Bill, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was... That was quite stressful and I probably didn't seek, and seek uh, enough advice yep. which in retrospect I learned a valuable lesson from that. Yep. Yep. Uh, do you want to expand any more on that? We can cut this bit out otherwise. Well it's a long time ago and I sort of don't think about it much these days. I yep. uh, only, only think about the good things. Yep. Okay great. What area in business do you feel you had to work on the most to add the greatest value? I think getting and creating employment for because in the in the early nineties, you know, uh, unemployment was in some country areas like Shepparton's was more than ten percent. And in the first couple of years, you know, we built up employing more and more people, and it, it was really good to see those people uh, enjoying their jobs and uh, you know. I had a job and that, that, that gave me great satisfaction. So would you say you, work, you worked on the most at the greatest value then is building that team basically? Yeah. Yeah. Without right. that team, the business wouldn't have got yep. to where it was. That's a good thing to remember because I, before I moved to London in 2006, went out for lunch with a client from our web company who's an architect in Melbourne and Joe, but he's a lovely bloke and he said to me, um, how old are you? And I, I told him, I think I was... 33 at the time, he said, so you've never been in work when there's been a recession on? Because basically I started uni in 92, uh, so missed that re- recession. But it's a, it's a good point to note the context of when you were starting out, not only in, in a recession, but then that unemployment was just rocketing up. Yes. Uh, and to be able to create eventually in the late 90s up to 30 jobs, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. What have you enjoyed the least about managing the fast growth? Uh, <laughs> there again, um, managing people. Yep. <laughs> As I like to say, it's the hardest thing in small business, but it's also where the value's at. That's right. So you know, I, I recognise both sides, but it's quite was was the biggest challenge, I think, is to yeah find the right people and, and be comfortable and you know just. Uh, to make sure that you uh, not only pick the right person, but that person is going to grow in the job. And what do you love most about growing a small business? Love most about? Yep. Um, I think the challenge of the unknown. Mm-hmm. Because in the early days, we were flying by the seat of our pants. Like we had no business plan for the first couple of years. After that, when we got um, um, an accountant and someone in IT, we could formulate some business plans and yep great and what was the biggest mindset shift you had in that journey that um the second time around like from a partnership this one was going to work yep like and that was really important to me great 
And what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Um, resilience mm-hmm. and the ability to see a little bit ahead mm-hmm. and use the instincts, rely on your instincts to make early calls. Jump over to growersmallbusiness.com and leave your details to get a short two-minute email I send on Fridays to help small business owners like you become better leaders. I include some reading or professional development resources I've discovered in the last week. Can you talk a bit about how you added people to the team, some wins, mistakes and advice for those listening? Yeah. um, There was a couple of occasions where uh, in the selection process, I got uh, another team member involved um, <clears throat> and I left the final, this 90% of the final decision to him. Mm-hmm. And I had a gut feeling that it was a wrong decision, but I didn't make that call because the new employee was going to be reporting directly to... Um, to that person. To that person. Yep. So I thought, oh, this is not... We'll give this a fly. The, the guy was well qualified, blah, 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 but there was something missing. Anyway, yeah. there was something missing. It didn't work. So that, that was a valuable lesson for um, my, my main man employee. He was the, the IT man mm-hmm. and, uh, and for me. Yep. I should have made the, I should have, uh, made the call because it did cost us some money. Yeah, right. And productivity. And what are some things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help the growth? Um, look after your people and reward them for jobs well done, like whether it be few verbal communication or a bonus or just take a, have a group dinner or let's sort of get, get together. Friday night drinks, whatever. But it was very important to have the team all pulling in the one direction. Yep. Great. And how much professional development did you invest in yourself, in, you know, in, in those years? Conferences? Very little. Well, no, you went to conferences overseas, which is Correct. where you, I think you said you came back with that idea in the US about convenience stores really is where the margin's at or the profits oh, are. Yeah, I agree. There was always opportunities when these um, conferences presented and uh, the, the, the best one by far was that one on the convenience store conversions and seeing the opportunity there to add value. Yep. Uh, did you have any mentors or coaches along the way? Yeah, I had a, a couple of friends. Um, one is one of my peers mm-hmm. and also um, uh, another one who, who was Chris's father, uh, who approached me in the first place. He was a great mentor, John, yep. big John. He's John, not with us it, anymore. But is it John Daly? Yeah. That's he's right. Not, he's not with us anymore, but he was a fantastic – and he, he had great perception and he knew how to pick people. So <laughs> I, I just sort of get a bit of satisfaction that uh, maybe he picked right with me. Yep. Yeah. Great. I remember him. His son as well. He was a lovely bloke, John. I remember him, yeah. Correct, yeah. And not the golfer, John Daly, the, the big golfer. No, not, not him. It's similar, <laughs> that's similar stature, actually, but yeah. much different, much different uh, personality. Yeah. And you obviously had a board of directors with the BP guys. Yeah, there was. Uh, we had Chris and myself, and yep. two from BP, and one of the BP guys was the chairman. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and it worked very well. And was that monthly or quarterly or quarterly? Yep. Right. Right. So you're one of the few I've had on that's actually exited the business, not just operationally, but also financially. So can we talk a bit about the, the exit, your experience, any advice you'd give? Uh, yes. It was sort of a relief to be out of the industry at that time. It was pretty, getting pretty tough because the cost of the product was going up. Up, and, up until where I left, we'd, we'd never borrowed any money apart from leasing um, uh, um, equipment, mainly trucks, and equipment for service stations. But we never had any overdrafts, never had any big borrowings. So. And it was getting to the point where 
with our, our costs getting up over a dollar a litre. And if you're selling 100 million litres a year, you've got to, maybe to have some capital if you're not getting your money in the same time as you're paying for it, for the product. Yep. So that, that was a relief fan, but after three months, I sort of was bored, so bought another small business. And That was another curly question I had here penned ready to ask you. Let's talk about... Uh, <laughs> what appeared to me and I guess Faye, your wife too, because I'm sure we looked at each other a couple of times when you said you've just announced you bought another little business after you were, air quotes, uh, retired. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about that. What, those couple of businesses that you bought, one was uh, like a tag and test fire business, fire extinguisher checking business every six months. Yeah, that, that was a, I saw an opportunity there. This, the guy that had it was sort of a little um, worn out and uh, there was an opportunity there. So Hopped in there for a couple of years, grew it, and I sold it. I always had in my mind, I'd go, I'm going to buy this, build it up, and sell it to a guy who is not in the same industry but needed to add this business into his business, which the two together would have, would have made a whole, a whole business of fire protection. So you had that the plan, I guess, at, from day one, that's what you wanted to do. You wanted to build it up to sell it off yeah. and you already I had. I no of staying there. Yeah, and uh, so so my memory isn't correct that I thought it was more of a bit of a hobby just to keep yourself busy. It was You had a strategic plan there, a play, that you wanted to execute and you clearly did. Yeah. Was that the... The, the, the real, the real um, quirky little business I bought yeah, this one I want to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> was this, which, one, which one came first after um, Advanced Petroleum? Was it the, the quirky one? The quirky one. Let's talk about the quirky one then. <laughs> aerial photography. Yeah. And back <laughs> then there weren't drones. What, what were they, Dad? There were no drones and I couldn't fly a plane. So, so what were you using? <laughs> a helium-filled blimp. Massive blimp. I remember the seen these blimps uh, yep. that I use over, over events for advertising and things. Well, basically it was one of those with a camera hanging off the bottom of it, which you could control remotely and take photos. Yeah. But unfortunately, when I, I, I actually bought this, I didn't buy the business, I just bought the equipment. Unfortunately, when I did, we were probably one year into the, a drought that was going to last for 10 years. Right. So, and the idea of this thing was to take photos of farm properties either for the farmer to hang on the wall or for real estate agents for properties, not only farms but residential. Yep. Of course, when you take a photo from a couple hundred feet up or higher and you've just got dirt and dead, everything dead, it just doesn't look very good. No, no, it doesn't. So there was um, virtually no business. So I was sold it all, I'm sold it all to a guy at um, Gosford who was taking real estate at beach properties and things. Yep. He, he was already in the business. But yeah. It was an interesting experience. Yeah, and then the fire biz, fire tagging or testing business and then was there anything else after that? I think you actually... No, that, was it. that was it, Troy. You started. <laughs> Adam got you into cycling and that was your new fixation, I guess. Yep, <laughs> was, yeah, new passion. Yeah, great. Yeah. Any advice you'd give to business owners thinking about exiting either operationally and or financially from your experience? Uh, no, when no, when you're ready. Yeah. Unless unless the offer is too good to refuse, but um, you know, if you're finding it a bit uh, stressful, don't give up straight away. Look at every aspect before you uh, do uh, call it quits. That's providing the business is going well and making money, and you're not forced to. Yep. Yeah. Great. All right, we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Choosing the right people. Yep, totally agree on that one. Definitely. That's my, my hardest thing as well. Favourite business book which helped you the most? Well, um, you, you, I, you may remember this, but you, you actually gave me this book in 1995 when it was first released by uh, Michael Gerber and it's called uh, E-Myth. Yeah, so it's my favourite business book, yes. Okay, so that has probably been the only one, I guess. I think you've given me one or two others, but this one really stood out. Yep. 
Yeah, it's great. Good. It's still current too. So I was, uh, how old was I then? 22. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 22, yeah, that's right. Wow, mm-hmm. okay. Uh, any great podcasts or online learning tools you, you know, you'd recommend to people? Um, well, because I uh, haven't been in business for quite some time, the only real business podcast I'll listen to is yours because, <laughs> <laughs> because I find it not only entertaining, I find it quite, um, you know, quite um, spellbinding in, in that these people that you talk to <clears throat> and interview, they've done some amazing things. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and you know they're all amazing young people, and and, and it's just I was blown away by the by the capabilities of some of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm in awe sometimes at unearthing because obviously I started interviewing put my network down here in Tasmania and eventually got out of the state in, onto the mainland and overseas, but really in awe at unearthing some of the gems down here in Tasmania, particularly the tech companies that people just don't really realise are global behemoths, you know, 30 to 50 million yeah. a year top line. It's great. Great. And very business. successful businesses too. Yeah. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? Probably a men- finding a good mentor. Mm. Yep. Very important. Um, one that doesn't that doesn't have to be uh, in the same industry, but I think uh, that would have helped me a lot way back in the seventies and eighties. Yeah, totally agree. And, and you were a mentor to me early on, and obviously a lot of the times I ignored your advice. Being your advice, being a a young obstinate. Uh, um, person so well, you, you, you must have got it from me troy because that's how i was when i was young <laughs> I, I, I do remember mum saying that <laughs> we, we don't only just look alike and have similar mannerisms uh, but yeah, yeah, correct that's mum did tell me that before she passed that a lot of uh, uh my stage of business uh, and and i guess growing up was similar to your own so yeah totally agree on mentors as well that's uh, four out of four. We're going to be the same <laughs> on the last one. What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Well, seek more advice about um, running a business and particularly just talking to other people in who own a business, older people, people with experience, um, because I, I went in... F- Blind on the first first bought the truck in 1969 and almost went broke the first year by not seeking advice and listening to people. Yep, I knew everything. I was I you know I was 21 or something and I, I yeah I knew everything. I was going to blow everybody away. You know, <laughs> didn't work. Uh, yeah, the um, naivety and youth, you know, the ignorance is, is yeah, it's still there now. It's, it's not just Gen, yeah, what are we up to, Gen Ys, Gen Zs. It's not just them. It's, you know, it's a common thing over the generations. Mm. Yeah. Some of us learn. Yes. Yeah. Well, great. Thanks, Dad. I think um, if anyone wants to know what why I'm in small business and why I like a challenge, I think listening to your journey, and I've learned a lot today, actually. Um, I didn't realise... Uh, a lot of similarities in our in our journeys and paths on business, and well, yeah, thanks, thank- for, thanks for having me on because it's been a real pleasure. And uh, as I said before, I'm really getting a lot of pleasure out of listening to the people you interview and the way you go about it. It's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm getting a lot out of it as well, enjoying it. So thanks for your time. You are entirely welcome. <laughs> thanks, Troy. Thanks. And for our audience, we would greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 